Great. Thank you very much, Liam. And thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you all today. Um, it's nice to be back in Pasadena, kind of virtually. <laughs> um, yeah, I was there for um, three years at, at JPL and uh, really enjoy my time there. Uh, enjoy my time there so it's nice to nice to be back in some way um, so today I want to tell you a little bit about nature and nature astronomy and take you kind of behind the th behind the scenes of um, of these journals and tell you a little bit about how they how they work and how you as an author can um, kind of uh, optimize uh, optimize your chances of, su of success let's say um, how you know give you some tips on how to um, improve your submissions so that um, uh, there'll be um, so that the communication will be more effective basically um, so here's what uh, here's what I'm going to uh, talk to you about today I'm briefly going to introduce uh, the journals nature and nature astronomy and also mention the wider nature portfolio of journals um, particularly some journals that you might not yet be aware of um, that could be potential venues for your for your research. Um, most of the talk is going to be on section two, um, tips and tricks for submitting research papers to nature or nature astronomy. Um, and then I'll follow up on that by talking about other kinds of um, articles that you can uh, publish in nature astronomy, not necessarily research papers, but um, comment and opinion papers and things like that. Um, which can also be uh, be good for you. Um, and then finally, I just want to say a brief, um, a brief few words about how to get involved in reviewing for nature journals. That's particularly aimed towards early career researchers um, who um, you know often ask about these things and for whom it can be beneficial to have um, something like that on on CVs or app, or you know fellowship applications or so on. Um, and mostly uh, I want to devote uh, some time to questions and answers because often uh, they are the most interesting parts of these talks um, and so I'll try and give the full 15 minutes for, for questions from the audience. Um, okay, let's kick off with a brief introduction to nature, nature astronomy and the wider nature portfolio. So I guess I don't really need to introduce nature, it's probably um, probably the world's most famous journal. Um, it is definitely the world's most cited journal, apart um, according to um, Clarivet, that kind of uh, uh, assesses all of these things and does uh, decides on impact factors and so on. Um, it's very old. It's uh, 152 years old, um, and we celebrated its 150th birthday a couple of years ago by um, slightly redesigning the typeface in the nature uh, nature cover there. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed any difference. It was very hard to see actually. Um, but uh, nature, nature has been for a long time the kind of um, the, the pinnacle of, of publishing in, in our community um, in terms of you know, astronomy and planetary science. Uh, but it has a very limited, um, limited amount of page space that can um, that can actually be devoted to astronomy and planetary science. And actually, um, it's probably punching above its weight because um, uh, they managed to publish about 40 or 50 papers a year. Um, and obviously, Nature itself is a very broad scope journal covering, um, you know, life sciences, medicine, um, physical sciences, and now even branching out to social sciences and, and engineering and things like that. So to devote 50 papers a year to astronomy is, is quite impressive. Um, and since submissions are high, um, then obviously acceptance rates are very low. And I think the latest numbers in general for acceptance at nature um, are around 8%. So, um, you know, it's often seen as quite prestigious to get published in nature um, and obviously uh, uh, a badge of honor to, uh, to uh, to yeah, to actually see your work in print in, in nature. Um, generally, astronomy content in nature is handled by one editor, and that is the, the guy you can see there on the left, that's Leslie Sage. Um, he has been at nature for for decades. <laughs> um, I think I think he's been there for 27 years or something like that. Um, and so all of the kind of 
major breakthroughs in astronomy that you've seen in the pages of nature have been through, uh, been passed through his hands over the last couple of decades. For instance, the, the first detection of um, an exoplanet around a sun-like sun star um, and various other Nobel Prize winning <laughs> uh, papers have passed through his hands. So he's seen, he's seen quite a lot over his uh, two decades. To, well, more than two decades, and he is um, now quite quite looking forward to retirement in just a few years. Actually, um, he's uh, yeah, he's certainly put in his time for nature. Um, so he he publishes he, he handles most of the uh, submissions in astronomy and planetary science that go to nature. Um, but if you work in planetary science in particular, you may have come into contact with um, another editor, uh, John Van der Kar. So he, um, his background is in the geosciences, and so he sometimes handles papers on moon, uh, on the moon or the or Mars, and so his his name is another name that you might um, you might come into contact with um, at uh, when you submit your paper to Nature. So Nature Astronomy is um, is actually a separate journal to Nature. It took um, some people in the community some time to work that out, but um, it is uh, a separate journal, um, editorially independent from Nature. Um, so we opened our manuscript system in uh, 2016, and uh, that means that next month we'll be celebrating our fifth birthday um, at the start of January. So we publish about twice as many papers as, um, as Nature does on um, a similar kind of uh, scope of, of subject. So we also cover astronomy and planetary science, and that is, you know, quite quite all encompassing. Um, we uh, uh, cover, you know, cosmology and um, experimental work, laboratory work, um, observational work, and theoretical work. Uh, kind of the whole um, the whole gamut of the astronomical sciences. Um, we kind of uh, because we have more page space to offer, um, we are more generous in our acceptance rate. So um, currently it's around 25% of submissions um, actually make their way to being published in Nature Astronomy. And rather than everything going through one editor, we have a team of four editors um, working full time um, on the journal, uh, but specializing in different areas. So here's a quick introduction to the team. Um, so our chief editor, is uh, Mei Chow. So she, her background um, originally was in um, radio astronomy and then um, condensed matter physics. And then she joined um, Nature um, a long time ago, actually. And she was one of the editors who launched Nature Physics when it launched um, 15 or so years ago, I think. Um, nowadays, she um, had, she's the chief editor at Nature Astronomy, and she she um, she took charge of the launch of Nature Astronomy. Um, and she doesn't handle many manuscripts these days, but when she does handle manuscripts, um, she likes to get stuck into gravitational waves and cosmology and the physics side of things. Um, and then we have three um, senior editors in the team, um, and our expertise is quite different and. Um, we yeah we come from different research backgrounds so for instance my background is in astrochemistry uh, looking at young stars and and old stars in particular and so these days i handle submissions on stars the ism um, the milky way and the local group um, galaxies and sometimes solar system um, my colleague luca is um, his background is in planetary atmospheres and so he naturally handles submissions on um, planets and, um, and exoplanets and sometimes uh, solar physics as well. Um, and then a new member of the team, uh, Morgan Hollis, he is, um, he's just joined us uh, just about a month ago and he is going to be handling all of our galaxy content and cosmology and also some of the solar physics. His background is in exoplanets, but actually he's been working recently with monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. So he's um, got quite a broad, um, broad scope there in background. So 
So, uh, as I said, Nature Astronomy launched about five years ago, and um, it, um, you know, it came at a time when astronomy submission, uh, astronomy papers in the field were growing quite, quite rapidly. So on the, on the left here is um, a plot of the archive submissions split up by um, uh, different topics, and you can see astrophysics there at the bottom in, in red, and you can see that astronomy papers were pretty much doubling over the space of a, of a decade. Um, and so at the time that Nature Astronomy launched, it was really a prime time to launch a new journal. Um, I mean, we at the time, we had some very established journals who had been around for decades, if not centuries, um, publishing very good stuff um, in, in a very good way. Um, but the, the growth in the number of papers in astronomy mean, meant that it was um, quite a good time to launch a new journal. And in fact, um, as we've seen since then, we've, we've probably, got, probably got at least two or three new journals from major publishers in astronomy um, since then. Um, so obviously, uh, the Planetary Science Journal has come out in the last couple of years, and uh, Monthly Notices is now going to launch a new journal next year. Um, looking at instrumentation and, and techniques and so on. So um, clearly astronomy is booming and in terms of publication numbers. Um, I think monthly notices itself published about four and a half thousand papers last year. Um, and in total, I think there are something like 30,000 papers in astronomy published every year. And so one of the kind of key reasons for publishing Nature Astronomy was to highlight um, the most important um, advances in our field to kind of, um, you know, to, to separate, separate out your paper um, from the masses um, and give the, the, really, um, the really breakthrough science a chance to shine. Um, and so we can see this from this, uh, this figure, which covers nature journals in general. Um, so it basically shows um, uh, that nature branded journals are cited around 12 times more than, um, than typical journals in the field and download, articles are downloaded 34 times more um, than um, papers in other journals. So the nature, the, nature, um, the nature style, the nature brand certainly gets, um, gets research seen and that's one of the the main reasons for um, uh, reaching into astronomy, um, because uh, astronomy uh, astronomy research is obviously very widely interesting, not only to scientists but also to the general public, and that made it a good um, a good time to launch a new journal. It's not only in the in the community itself, the research community itself, that um, nature astronomy is making. Um, making research better seen. Um, obviously, nowadays we have um, very uh, active um, presences on, on social media. And so here are some more numbers to look at um, nature, uh, articles in nature and, and the nature research journals were mentioned three million times on Twitter. Um, and also we have another a new way of measuring their kind of impact, um, and that is the ultra altmetric score. And so you can see these colored donuts here, which show the ultrametric score for some nature astronomy papers, which gives an, an idea of impact not, not only in social media, but also in, um, in our, in our um, society in general. So you can see, you might be able to see here that uh, you can uh, see how many times research papers are mentioned in Wikipedia. Um, and I've cut a bit off here that shows how many times these papers are published, uh, mentioned in policy documents and so on. Um, and so I think um, it was a really good time to bring that kind of uh, visibility to, um, to astronomy. And it's not only the research that we publish in, um, in nature and nature astronomy. Uh, we also publish um, kind of contextual information for that research as well to kind of uh, 
and make its make make its context more clear, make it make the implications of that research, uh, research more clear. And so we publish um, kind of supporting articles such as News and Views, um, which are specialist, which are kind of general summaries written by a specialist in in the field to kind of broaden the scope of a, of a research paper to a bigger audience. Um, we've also launched a new blogging site uh, called uh, the Astronomy Community at Nature, and um, there we can also have some um, some more contextual information behind papers. So we have this very uh, fun and interesting sometimes uh, uh, channel in the in the blog site called Behind the Paper, where authors can share their stories that go into um, their their latest research. And obviously, we can also dedicate editorial space to um, the very um, the most important research, and so we can put together editorials and um, and other editor and ed other um, other content from the editors of the journal supporting that research. I just want to introduce you to some other journals that you may not be aware of um, in the wider nature portfolio. Um, so I've talked about Nature, which is the flagship journal that's been around for 150 years or so. Um, and then Nature Astronomy is an example of a nature research journal. Um, and we've had nature research journals for a good few decades now. And you may be aware of uh, journals like Nature Geoscience and Nature Physics. So um, before Nature Astronomy was around, Nature Geoscience handled a, a lot of the planetary science content that got published in, uh, in Nature and nature journals and nature physics um, handled a lot of the uh, kind of pure astronomy and pure uh, kind of physical side of astronomy content that was published in, in the nature portfolio. Um, but now with nature astronomy, I think um, it becomes the, the kind of more natural home for both planetary science and, and, uh, and true astronomy. Um, other journals in the portfolio, one, uh, one broad scope journal that has quite a high impact factor is Nature Communications. Um, so this is an open access journal that's been around for um, I think 10 or 15 years now. Um, and it publishes everything from life sciences all the way to physical sciences and beyond. Um, and then kind of in the tier below uh, Nature Communications, we have some very new journals that are not as broad scope, but they're um, kind of multidisciplinary in that they deal with um, uh, very traditional uh, subject areas, for instance, physics or biology or chemistry. Um, and these are also open access journals that sit below Nature Communications. And then we have um, a, a mega journal, which basically uh, publishes any kind of vali valid um, uh, science and um, includes astronomy as well, uh, that is scientific reports. And I think, um, I'm not sure of the latest, um, the latest figures, but it used to be uh, the world's largest journal. Um, I think it may have been overtaken now, but it is certainly publishing a lot of, uh, a lot of content. And then um, a, a reviews journal, which is quite, um, uh, quite something to take, um, to be aware of actually, because it publishes some really interesting stuff, uh, Nature Reviews Physics. So it's primarily physics focused, but it does have some very interesting astronomy content. Um, they've published some interesting reviews on gravitational waves and, uh, and other things like that, kind of the physics side of astronomy recently. Um, and it, they do a very nice job there. So I, I recommend you have a look at Nature Reviews Physics um, for their astronomy content. So that's that's kind of my introduction to the nature portfolio and to nature and uh, nature astronomy. Um, now I want to give you some um, tips and some uh, tricks to um, to help you when you're submitting your research to nature or nature astronomy to um, to optimize your um, chances of, of success. Um, so. I think the first thing to be aware of is that um, nature and nature astronomy are very different to 
standard journals, the journals that are publishing the bulk of the research in our field, like monthly notices or like astronomy and astrophysics or like the AAS journals. So those journals are looking for original research um, that is scientifically valid. Um, and, you know, nature journals are looking for the same kind of thing, original research, some uh, research that hasn't appeared elsewhere and um, scientifically valid research but it is looking for um, some additional criteria to be met as well. And these, um, these are kind of key things to be aware of if you're um, an author thinking about submitting to nature or nature astronomy. So we're looking for, additionally, we're looking for novelty. So that means a new result um, or a new way of, um, a new way of working, a new technique, a new, um, a new mechanism, um, something that hasn't been done before um, and so that's a key, a key component um, of, the, of the papers that we are um, looking at. Um, and that novelty should also bring about a significant advance in understanding of astronomy or planetary science. Um, so that should be, you know, not just um, a minor advance, but something actually significant and striking above and beyond what we know already about, um, about the universe. Ideally, um, uh, successful papers should be of wide interest. So this, the definition of wide kind of depends on the journal that you're submitting to. So for Nature, um, ideally, um, the editor is looking for papers that will be of interest to all of astronomy or all of planetary science. For Nature Astronomy, the scope is a bit different because we're, we're a more specialized journal. So for instance, if you work on um, if you work on star formation, for instance, then we would want your paper to be of interest to other people working in star formation. It doesn't necessarily have to appeal to cosmologists or, um, or planetary scientists, but um, as long as people in your uh, research area would be interested in it, then um, it will be uh, worth considering for nature or nature astronomy. And, you know, when it comes down to it, I think, as I've shown um, with the kind of limited numbers of papers that we can publish, we're looking for the best papers of the year. Um, for Nature, the editor is looking for maybe one of the best 50 papers of the year. And for Nature Astronomy, we're looking for one of the best um, 100 or 150 papers of, year, of the year. And of course, um, the best the best is very hard to define, <laughs> um, but in our minds, in, in the minds of editors, we'll be thinking to ourselves, okay, is this research um, really uh, top grade? So those are some things to um, be aware of. Um, and so my tip there is to be realistic when assessing your own research and its appropriateness for nature or nature astronomy. Um, so that is, um, you know, think to yourself um, before submitting, okay, is this, is this work my best work or is this work one of going to be one of the best 150 papers of the year by some definition of best? Um, and I would kind of stress that, you know, you shouldn't be too hard on yourself. Um, when you submit to Nature or Nature Astronomy, then um, we do have a high rejection rate, but um, you'll find out about that um, uh, you'll find out whether you get rejected or not fairly quickly. So it's, um, I would say it's usually worth, um, worth a shot if you, if you think um, your, the work that you want to submit is within, um, you know, a reasonable shot of getting published, then go for it. Um, you know, in, uh, you may only lose a week of, um, a week of your time while the paper gets assessed and, uh, gets assessed and you may actually um, end up uh, progressing towards publication. Um, I would also say um, in, the, in the don't be too hard on yourself um, kind of category, um, we did a study a few years ago that showed um, that um, I think about 90% of submissions came from, 90% uh, of submissions to nature and nature astronomy came from men um, and only 10% uh, came from women. And so that's underrepresentative of women in in our community and so we kind of concluded from that that um, uh, women were kind of self-censoring themselves too much 
and not, uh, you know, perhaps being too hard on themselves and their, their own research. And so I would encourage um, women in particular to um, uh, think, uh, think more about submitting to nature and nature astronomy and uh, try and bring those uh, numbers up. Um, and let me go back to um, presenting a new work or a new, um, new result. Um, so we see a lot of submissions um, uh, which, are, which present very interesting science, you know, um, science that we would um, very happily publish. Um, but where the, where the science has kind of been spoiled by a previous paper. So for instance, you've got, um, uh, you've done a survey of something, uh, uh, an observational survey, and you find a very interesting thing. Um, in the survey paper, you might write, okay, we did, this, uh, we did this analysis and this analysis, and we found this very interesting thing. Here's the key results. You know, we found a new planet around su such and such a star. And then we'll follow, um, we'll follow up um, this result in more detail in another paper. So when that, when, that, uh, when that secondary paper comes to nature or nature astronomy, then um, because the kind of punchline of the research has already been given away in the, in the overview paper of the survey, for instance, um, then the novelty of that second paper is significantly compromised by that kind of spoiler in the first paper. So I would say when you're thinking about submitting work to nature and, or nature astronomy, make sure that um, you know, you present the big results first, um, and then you can um, think about getting the, the survey paper published or the, the, the kind of follow-up paper published um, without any kind of threat of um, compromising the novelty of the nature submission. Um, so that's uh, another tip. Um, also, under the bracket of understanding what we're looking for, um, some, you know, we, we publish short form papers. Um, uh, at most, we're thinking about eight pages for nature and maybe 10 pages of, of research for nature astronomy. And some work is just too detailed or too complicated to fit into that format. In fact, you know, we often see people trying too hard to um, fit their, you know, very expansive and very detailed research into that small kind of um, form factor. And that really just, just doesn't work in some cases. Um, I mean, we do, have, um, we do have supplementary information, which in theory is, you know, a PDF of pretty much unlimited size. So you can fit a significant amount of text in there and num a number of figures as well. Um, but I think you have to think um, quite carefully about whether the result that you actually want to um, publish will, will work well with um, a short form paper. So my tip here is be realistic about nature formatting and not everything is going to work um, in, in nature format. And um, yeah, sometimes um, it's better to um, submit those more detailed works or or more, um, more lengthy works to another journal, even if it is um, still going to be, um, you know, an exciting, exciting result. Um, if you're unsure about whether your research is appropriate for, to, for, for nature or nature astronomy, then um, we do um, offer the service of responding to pre-submission inquiries. Um, uh, I don't think this is something that other journals offer, um, but it is a, um, a quick, a theoretically quick way to get some feedback on your work and its and its um, suitability for for nature or nature astronomy. So this works in one of two ways. You can either send us editors an email, or you can go to our manuscript system and enter a pre-submission inquiry there. And basically, this is basically a short summary of your paper. It can be an abstract or a couple of paragraphs, maybe a figure, um, just to give the gist of your result and that you would like to um, like to get published and ideally you will explain to us editors you know how your 
how your new result meets the criteria that we're looking for. So how is it novel? How does it advance understanding? Um, what other papers are out there that might be a threat to uh, the novelty of your work? And who might be interested in reading um, about this new result? Um, and so you can just write, you know, fairly informally to us um, and asking whether uh, theoretically um, the work should be suitable for nature or nature astronomy. And then ideally you'll get a response within a week and you can go for a full submission or you can um, uh, find another journal to submit to. So that's something that, um, uh, yeah, if you're in doubt about submitting to a, to a nature journal, you can write and ask us. Um, another tip for submissions is that um, even though we're, quite, we're kind, of, kind of agnostic when it comes to formatting of manuscripts that come into, uh, come, come into our journals, it, is, it would be beneficial if they were roughly the right length. And that will help us as editors to judge whether um, you know, your work could actually work well with our format. Um, so ideally, it doesn't really matter if you're using a AAS journal template or a monthly notices template. Um, if it's roughly 6,000 words long, um, then that will help us as editors to assess your work and be confident about whether it would uh, fit into the journal. Um, and I will say that we do have a new, kind of new, couple of months old LaTeX template um, for authors to use. Um, uh, it's it's very bare bones. It's very straightforward. Um, it doesn't format uh, your paper, your manuscript as a nature or nature astronomy um, paper, but it does give us everything we need as editors to um, to assess your paper, and it gives referees a nice clear um, template to work, a uh, nice clear manuscript to work with. One, um, one final tip that I'll give you as an author for submitting to an H journal, um, I would suggest writing a cover letter. I mean, some people don't do this nowadays. In fact, um, I had one person write to me in a cover letter to say that cover letters were old fashioned now and weren't needed, um, which I thought was quite ironic. Um, but it, I think it can be a key opportunity to communicate you know, author to editor directly um, and get a, you know, it's another opportunity for you to convince the editor that your um, work is worth um, consideration. Um, so I would suggest, um, again, just a couple of paragraphs, really. Um, what is the take home message of your, your result, uh, your work, your result, um, thinking about the nature criteria? Um, it's a good place to put in suggestions for referees. Um, maybe people you've, um, you've come across before that you think would do a, a good job or at least a fair job. Um, it's also cover letters a good place to uh, list referees to avoid that might, um, for instance, have a conflict of interest. They're working on a, a similar topic and have a similar paper under consideration um, somewhere else. And cover letters are a great place to put in any special information that we as editors might need to know. Um, so for instance, if you've got another paper at another journal, um, or indeed if, there's, if you're aware of a competing uh, paper at another journal, um, you might want to tell the editor about that. Um, and if you have any, any scheduling constraints, for instance, if you want to get your, your paper published in time for the AAS meeting and so on. So I would suggest uh, writing a cover letter to the editor. It doesn't have to be terribly formal. It doesn't have to be terribly long. Um, at most a page, I would say, um, but it's a key opportunity to talk directly to the editor. Um, so uh, there are other opportunities to publish in nature astronomy that don't involve writing a uh, research paper and having it assessed by, <laughs> by referees. Um, so like Nature, Nature Astronomy also has a magazine section where we have uh, shorter, uh, shorter articles um, that um, uh, should be connected to astronomy or planetary science, but they can be um, dealing with more, for instance, societal issues or um, wider issues in general. Um, there are a number of different formats that we offer. 
Um, and some of these I'm just going to highlight to you. Um, so those, those ones I've listed here um, with an asterisk, those are the ones that we are open um, to uh, suggestions for. Um, so you can, if you have an idea for one of these, um, one of these types of articles, you can write to one of us editors and, uh, and give us your pitch. Um, I'll just highlight um, the mission control column, which is a, um, an article that we, that we publish based on usually a new mission or an instrument or telescope, um, a very short article that just kind of highlights that new, um, new facility to the community. Um, uh, for instance, we just, um, just published one on the Lucy mission, um, and we've published things you know, telescope receivers or new, new telescopes. Um, so a variety of different uh, kind of technical focused short form articles just to uh, let people know about new developments on that front. Um, comment articles are basically our opinion pieces, um, but actually we use them very broadly. Uh, they can be um, they can be very science focused or they can be very community focused. Um, and so, you know, they, they're very, um, very kind of, you know, interesting and flexible format for um, writing different kinds of short form articles that um, you may want to um, take the opportunity of writing. Um, and one, one piece that I, one type of article that I would um, like to uh, uh, kind of, uh, make you aware of is something called a worldview, which is something that we hope to be publishing more of next year. Um, basically, this is a very short opinion piece. Um, so if you have a particular uh, message that you want to convey to the community in our field, um, this could be a, you know, a societal issue, or it could be something about research, or it could be something about science that you want to um, convey, then um, I would encourage you to get in touch about writing a worldview article. Um, and other things that we publish, we also publish book reviews and uh, performance reviews, film reviews in our books and arts column. Um, we publish meeting reports. So if you if you organize a conference or you even um, you, even if you go to a good conference, then you could suggest um, a, a meeting report on that on that uh, conference, which is a short short overview or summary of a, of a meeting. Um, and we do actually publish uh, review papers ourselves. Um, these are very, uh, again, they're very short format uh, papers. Um, so they're more of a, they're more of a broad, um, kind of a broad and shallow um, kind of summary of a, of a field or a topic, or a very narrow and a, and a deep summary. Um, they're usually only about, well, about 4,000, 5,000 words long, which is about 12 or 15, 12 to 15 pages. So they're quite short compared to normal um, reviews. And so they have to be quite carefully selected in topic. Um, and so these kinds of content can often make their way into um, special issues of nature astronomy. And one, um, one thing that we like to do every year is pick up a, um, a kind of a community focus um, issue and, um, and put some content together on that topic. So this year, and in fact, last year, we, um, we presented a special issue on climate change and the connection of astronomy to climate change, the kind of impact of the work we do on, um, on the environment. Um, and so that's a good opportunity for authors to get involved. Um, and these, these particular pieces got quite a lot of attention, so they would be very good for, um, uh, you know, making your name known and, and putting on CVs and things like that. Um, in previous years, we've looked at diversity and equity and inclusion, um, which is a subject very close to our, our collective hearts on the editorial team. And um, we put together a, another focus issue on um, astronomy for development, looking particularly in, uh, at Africa and astronomy in Africa and how that's being used to support, you know, general education and improvement of facilities and things like that. 
Um, so all of these things are ways to get um, involved as an author in nature astronomy. We also, I should also say, we <laughs> also do focus issues on science. And so um, we've covered a number of topics and one perhaps close to, close to Caltech is our Spitzer re uh, retrospective that we published last year. Um, I think we put together uh, seven review articles on different aspects of um, Spitzer's science legacy and a number of shorter articles around that. And it was very, uh, very enjoyable and to put together and to read. Um, so I'll just just interject quickly, I think you have about five minutes and then we can move on to questions. Okay. Great. Yes, I am on the last um, section of the talk. Uh, just some thoughts about how particularly early career researchers can get involved in reviewing for nature journals. Um, it is quite straightforward. <laughs> um, so you publish a relevant paper on a topic that, um, that you're interested in studying. Um, ensure that you have publicly, con uh, publicly available contact details, and then just wait for the email from the author, uh, uh, from, the, from the editor, um, because th that is how we find reviewers um, in, in most cases. Basically, we, as when we get a submission, we read the relevant literature. Um, and so if you've written a paper that is relevant to one of our submissions, then um, as long as we can contact you in some way, um, then there's a fairly good chance of, um, of uh, getting an invitation to review that paper. Um, and so my tip here would be to, um, as, a, as an early career researcher, um, try to have a website with your details that doesn't kind of disintegrate when you change affiliations um, and move somewhere else. So something like a GitHub website or a, or a Google website or something like that, that you keep relatively up to date with um, contact details and even a list of published papers that is very useful for editors. Um, looking for referees. Um, I probably don't have time to go into this in any detail. Um, uh, in fact, I give you know whole hour, hour and a half long talks on how to review a paper uh, for a journal. So this is kind of a very succinct um, uh, summary of how to actually go about reviewing a paper. I mean, it's, it's, there is a lot of detail there, but these are the main kind of things. It is very useful to editors if you can summarize um, the key message of the paper that you're reviewing. Um, and that kind of gives us some confidence that you've understood what you're reading and gives the authors also some confidence that you as the referee have understood uh, what they're trying to convey. Um, then I would say it's useful to list the major, list the kind of main scientific um, issues with the work that you're that you're assessing. Um, uh, particularly note if these are kind of deal breaker things or these are things that um, could probably pass with some minor adjustment. Um, and then I would suggest moving on to some of the minor issues with the with the manuscript. Um, note that you're not always required to give um, a list of typos or grammar issues. It really depends on the journal that you're reviewing for. Um, at Nature Journals, we have um, copy editors that will um, correct all of those things. And so you don't need to do those things yourself. Um, for other journals, you may, um, may, be, may be useful if you can do that for the, for the authors, but please check the instructions. Um, and I would say uh, one key thing is that when you're reviewing a paper, um, it's really, you know, I often see quite a lot of negative reviews and it is, it can make a world of difference if when you see something that is praiseworthy to give praise for it. Um, you know, if the authors do a good job, if the authors explain things nicely or do a nice piece of analysis, then um, uh, a comment, uh, a positive comment for the authors is, um, is actually uh, quite a useful thing. Um, so bottom line here is um, my tip for being a referee is basically be the referee you would want to have reviewing your paper. So if you would want to have, um, you as an author would want to have a nice constructive review that gives you some, uh, some help or some praise, then uh, try and be that kind of referee for other people. And then hopefully the 
the academic world will be a better place. <laughs> um, I think that's pretty much everything I had to say. It was quite a whirlwind um, uh, tour of uh, the nature portfolio and uh, reviewing and authoring. Um, but I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, Paul. That was great. There were some um, there were some questions in the chat during your talk. So, yeah. Kunal, do you if you're online, do you want to pick one of those questions and start with that? Hey, uh, thanks for the talk again, Paul. Um, I had a um, few questions, actually. Um, maybe just a short question to begin with was uh, what is the impact factor of nature astronomy, astronomy specifically? Um, let's say, and compared to journals like the Nature Main Journal and MJ Letters. Mm. Um, um, so the, the astronomy landscape, journal landscape is kind of quite fractured. Uh, so you have um, Nature and Science, which publish um, astronomy and planetary science content. And they, they uh, at present, their impact factors are something like 45, nearly 50. Um, so extremely high. Um, and then you have quite a gap, and then you have nature astronomy, which comes in at an impact factor of 15, um, roughly, I think, latest number. Um, and then you have another gap to um, the kind of um, the kind of community journals, the society journals like AppJ Letters and uh, the Astrophysical Journal, Monthly Notices, and ANA, and they kind of sit in the region of impact factor five to eight. Um, so there's a good, you know, a good factor of two between nature astronomy and, and the standard journals, and then a good factor of, you know, two again, at least before you get to nature and science. I see. Thank you for that. Uh, I have another question, um, mm -hmm. is that you presented some alternative uh, avenues within nature portfolio, like... Uh, of course, we know of nature and nature astronomy, but then there's nature communications and nature scientific reports. How does one really, it, it kind of, I mean, as a, as a researcher, I, I'm, I'm kind of confused as to um, which one is the right journal, given a paper, which one is the right journal? And how, how does one distinguish between nature, nature astronomy, communications and scientific reports? Which one do I go to first or do I try them? One rejected, go to the other kind of, how, how does one decide? Is it the topic? Or, or something else? Yeah, I think um, so there are two things to take into account. One is the kind of scope of your paper, how broad it is, um, and whether you want to reach, for instance, all astronomers, you think it's something a result that's going to be relevant to all astronomers, in which case go to nature. Is it just going to be relevant to people in your field, um, in which case you might consider nature astronomy, or is it going to be relevant to you know a, a very thin slice of, of specialists in your in your field in which case you may want to go to a you know a general astronomy journal like you know uh, one of the WAS journals or you may want to go to nature communications um, to get um, you know to benefit from the impact factor of that journal so um, it depends on on the scope of your paper um, and who you want to who you really want to be reading your research I think um, probably the best, um, there's kind of a, um, a tiering system in, in internally. So um, if you submit a, a paper to Nature and it gets rejected, then the, uh, the Nature editor will probably recommend another uh, more suitable journal for you. Um, so they will guide you towards, you know, if they think it's suitable for nature astronomy, they will give you a link to nature astronomy. If they think it's suitable for nature communications, they will give you a link to nature communications. I mean, it's not, it's not something you have to follow. You can, of course, submit wherever you like and, and do whatever you like with your manuscript. Um, but if you start at the top, wherever that may be, nature or nature astronomy, um, and your your submission happens to be rejected, then usually the editor will give you some reasonable guidance about where it might fit in a different um, in a different journal. Yeah, I think that sort of answers Sasha's question. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sasha. Um, are there other questions? Just just raise your hand, and we'll call on you. If not, I still have one other question, but I'll wait for others. Maybe I could ask a quick one, which is, I find there's some confusion around the press embargo, whether or not you're allowed to post to archive, 
whether or not you're allowed to talk about your result at a conference. So could, could you just settle once and for all? What's it? <laughs> um, yes, actually, I have a slide for this, which may be uh, relevant. Um, okay, so yes, this the question about the archive comes up a lot. Um, and in the past, nature's kind of been fuzzy on this topic. Um, I'm not sure why <laughs> I wasn't around, but um, in the last couple of years, they've kind of made their archive policy clearer. And basically, you can post, you as an author can post um, your paper on the archive wherever, whenever you like. So that can be before you submit to Nature in the, in the refereeing process, it can be when it's accepted, it can be when it's published, it can be, you know, years later if you want to. So um, it has to be the original, um, the originally submitted version can go on the archive. And then should the paper be published, you can update that archive version with the published version, um, I think six months after after publication. Um, so, so technically you're allowed to post your um, manuscript on the archive at any time, but, um, you know, maybe that's not, you know, you, you as an author have to think about when the best time is for you to do that. So for instance, it can be, um, it can cause more of an impact, let's say, if you were to put your paper on the archive at the point of publication, um, so that you know nobody really knows about it before, and then it suddenly hits the scene and everybody's interested in it, and then they can either go to the nature version um, or they can go to the, the archive version. Um, but it's up to you. I mean, different fields work in different ways. Sometimes um, uh, researchers in some fields post their paper on the archive, you know, as soon as the, it's ready to be submitted, they get feedback from the community, they improve that um, the manuscript, and then they submit it to um, a journal. And this is all, you know, this is all perfectly fine. It's um, whatever is best for you as an author, I think. I, I have some experience to contribute on this question. Uh, so yeah, so this summer, me and a postdoc, Chris Mankovic, had a a paper published in Nature Astronomy, and we posted the archive before before the publication date, which was fine. But then some some members of the press started working on it and wrote some stories that they then published well before the actual press release that we were working on was going to come out. So they kind of stole some of our thunder, mm. and we, we asked them not to do this, but they did it anyway. So that's just a risk that you run if you post-archive ahead of time. Yeah. yeah, so so journalists are, you know, quite within their rights to write about anything they find on the archive. Um, but yeah, obviously for you as an author, that's kind of um, spoiled things a bit. <laughs> are there any other questions? Okay, Kunal, do you want to ask your last one? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, I'd, I'd specifically like to know about the peer review process in the context of this underrepresentation, and maybe if there is any, uh, I mean, things like unconscious bias, um, how are they tackled, um, women um, publishing less in these high rated journals, does that have to do with any biased peer review? And what are your recommendations um, for blind peer review, um, if I may? Hmm. I think, um, yeah, I mean, the peer review process is not um, not an exact science. Obviously, you know, it's 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 something that passes through humans and all of us are biased in some way. Um, you know, we have unconscious biases, we have conscious biases. Um, and, you know, that's, unfortunately, that's just the best system we have at the moment to kind of vet, um, vet research and, um, you know, decide what, what gets published and what does not get published. Um, and we have to, you know, do what we can to try and, you know, mitigate those biases. Obviously, we as editors can have um, some insight into whether we think a referee is biased or not and indeed we editors also have our own biases so it's it's a very messy situation um double blind 
peer review is um, is theoretically the you know a good answer to this. We've seen it with um, like uh, Hubble proposals and so on. Um, it really does uh, do a good job of leveling the playing playing field um, and giving opportunities to those who you know historically might not have had it. Um, I think in terms of um, peer review in in terms of publishing papers it um, it becomes it, it needs to become more widely accepted in our field I think we do have the option both nature and nature astronomy have the option of, of double blind peer review um, but the take up is really low um, I think I think it's somewhere maybe less than five percent of um, of papers actually opt for double blind peer review um, because I think with a research article it's it's much harder to um, ensure that anonymity and particularly you know you often have to build on previous research or you have to um, uh, you know uh, maybe you've built up a framework or a theoretical model that you use over and over again and it makes it fairly obvious who the actual authors are um, and so it doesn't it doesn't really work um, and also I think if you do opt for double blind peer review then you have to write the paper in a different way um, that kind of takes away the you know the the personal the personalness of the paper um, and then it just leads to a really um, an awkward re uh, manuscript for the for the referees to read and then when you're identity is finally revealed at the end, you may have to go through the process of kind of rewriting the paper to make it more natural sounding. Um, and so it's not really, yeah, there are no really good answers, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, theoretically, I think double blind peer review would be the way to go, but we nearly really need to see the whole community getting behind that and getting used to reading papers that are written in kind of a third person way um, before we can really, you know, um, yeah, use that to, to deal with any bi uh, potential biases. Thank you. Great. So we're over the hour now. Um, that was wonderful, Paul. Thanks very much. Thanks for letting us peer under the hood. Um, I'll stop the recording and uh, we'll upload that to YouTube in the next couple of months. Thanks again. Great. Thank you.